Hello, everybody. We're going to do a somewhat abbreviated introduction to complex numbers. Abbreviated just in the sense that uh, I'm going to try and go a little bit faster with uh, material, a little bit more compressed than we ordinarily would. Um, to introduce complex numbers, let's try and solve these two equations. Uh, so isolating the x. In this case, we have x is plus or minus 1. Um, and you can verify that that works by plugging 1 back in. 1 squared is 1, minus 1 is 0. Or negative 1, plug it back in. Negative 1 squared is 1, minus 1 is 0. So those work. Uh, what happens on this side if we isolate x is we get uh, x squared is negative 1. And if we just try and mechanically take the square root of both sides, we have that x equals plus or minus square root of negative 1. Um, but what is that square root of negative 1? Um, it's not really clear what that should be. Could it be a number? Well, let's try and prove for ourselves that it's not any of the kinds of number that we know already. Um, so we know that it needs to satisfy this equation, the one that came the step before. So we know that uh, whatever it is, if I plug it in as x and square it, it should end up equaling negative 1. So could x be a positive number? Could this uh, square root negative 1 be a positive number? Um, if I have a positive number and I square it, that can't be negative 1. So it can't be a positive number. Could it be a negative number? If I have a negative number and I square it, that is also positive, so it couldn't be negative 1. So it couldn't be negative. And 0, if I square it, is just 0. So uh, just by imagining which of these three types of number would satisfy the equation, it seems that none of them would. Um, so if we're going to decide that square root negative 1 is a number, it's definitely a new kind of number that's not positive and not negative and not 0. Let's just have a quick interlude here for a second and think about numbers as transformations. Um, so let's say I have some positive value x uh, denoted here on the uh, number line, the real number line. So let's imagine a number is a, b, and c, where a is 1 and a half times x, b is x plus 1, and c is x times negative 2. Pause the video, go ahead, plot where each of these would be approximately on the real line. Um, and then think about these as transformations. Multiplying x by 1 and a half is what kind of transformation if you're imagining that x is, say, a vector, for example. So pause the video, give it a try. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So one and a half x would be like uh, scaling, or to use a less technical term, stretching uh, the value of x one and a half times its original length. So if this is its original length, twice its original length would be here. So one and a half times would be about there. Um, so, uh, but the point I want to draw out is you can imagine multiplying by uh, a real value as scaling. Um, adding, what if we add 1? So we would just take this same distance and append it to the end here. And actually, uh, it looks like it's about the same place based on uh, where I drew x. Um, so adding 1 would be something like uh, shifting or translating. Uh, what about multiplying by negative 2? Well, negative 2 is going to... Uh, put us over on the left side here, and it's going to be at twice the x distance. So about there is negative 2x. Um, and so that is reflecting and, sh and uh, scaling also. So I reflected it to be on the negative side, and I stretched it out that way. Okay, so why am I having us think about uh, numerical operations as if they're transformations? Because uh, that's going to give us a good insight into uh, what is the square root of negative 1 really about? What is it really doing? Okay, so we know from the equation up there that uh, if x squared equals negative 1, we should be able to plug in square root negative 1 and satisfy the equation. So in other words, if I have 1 and I multiply it by root negative 1, and then I multiply it again by root negative 1, that should give me negative 1. So we can think about this geometrically in terms of transformations. Um, if I am imagining on the number line here, I've got the number 1, which you can think about as kind of that rightward facing vector of unit length. 
And if I was going to do two operations to it, um, let's multiply it by some value x and some value x to end up at negative 1. If we're thinking about multiplying by real numbers as either being scaling or reflecting, um, it doesn't seem like there's any geometric thing that I can do twice to get me to end up here. Like imagine I'm just stretching it. If I'm stretching it, I could stretch it this way, but stretching it twice to the right isn't going to make me end up at negative 1. If uh, x were a negative number, I know that would involve reflecting it, but I can't reflect it twice and end up at negative 1. Um, so what's, what's the solution here? Um, the solution is to realize that, and it took 100 years after uh, people started using these numbers to think of them geometrically in this way, um, but the number line here is not where all numbers live. The number line is really only the x-axis of a number plane where lots of other types of number live. Um, and those are called complex numbers. And any number that does not live on this x-axis here has what's called an imaginary part. Um, we choose to define the letter, or we'll use the letter i to designate the square root of negative 1. Um, this is what we're going to name it. And a number that has some component that's a, some multiple of the square root of negative 1, that's called the imaginary part of the number. So what, what, could, what geometric op operation could we do twice to get to negative 1? If we have the number 1 here and we rotate it by 90 degrees twice, that would get us to negative 1. Um, so let's try and fill out this table and kind of see how this plays out. So if I have 1 and I multiply it by i, that'll give me i. And in the complex plane, this axis is called the real axis. This axis is called the imaginary axis. Um, this is not the same thing as the Cartesian coordinate plane um, because every point in this plane is actually a single number. It's not a coordinate pair of numbers. Um, it's just that it's a single number that's made of two parts, a real part, which is uh, a real number, and then an imaginary part, which is how, like what, uh, I guess you could say, how many of these square roots of negative 1 do you have? Um, so this would be a single i, which is a unit length in this direction. This would be negative i, which would be a unit length down. Okay, so I multiply by i and... That would be a point here. If I multiply by i again, I get i squared, which is neg root negative 1 times root negative 1, is just negative 1. So that would be here. Um, go ahead and fill out, pause the video, fill out the rest of the table, and then uh, see how it makes sense geometrically. OK, so i cubed is like i squared times i. i squared, we already know, is negative 1. So negative 1 times i is just negative i i to the fourth is like i squared times i squared. I know each i squared is negative 1, so negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. If I have 1 and I multiply it by i, that should just be i. And then if I have i and I multiply it by another i, now I have negative 1 again. So this, this pattern all makes sense if you imagine it as rotations in the complex plane. This is the complex plane here. So each time, so if I have one, each time I multiply by i, it rotates uh, that number by 90 degrees around the origin of the complex plane. So I multiply by i and I get i. I multiply by i again and I get negative one. I multiply negative one by i and I get negative i. I multiply negative i by i, and I get 1 again. And then when I multiply 1 by i, I'm back to i, and then when I multiply that, I'm back at negative 1. Okay, so based on that, you should be able to figure out, for example, like what is i to the 33rd power just by imagining this cycle. So the big takeaway from what we've done so far is multiplying by i is <coughs> rotating by 90 degrees in the complex plane. Um, and this idea that multiplying has rotation built into it is the foundation of what makes complex numbers so useful. Everything that we're doing with trig right now, a lot of it works out a lot more cleanly and easily just using complex numbers because instead of thinking about 
uh, rotating in terms of trig functions, you can just think about it as multiplication. Come back in the next video.